In modern day, many people start to learn like at a birthday party. They're not necessarily hungry, but they eat some cake and some ice cream and they associate that with having fun, hanging out with their friends, being mm. social and opening presents. This brings up emotion. How can we work with emotion for anyone struggling with overeating, stress eating, mindless eating, even though we're not hungry, but just to avoid feeling sad or upset? I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm also a neuroscientist and a professor at Brown University, trying to help people change behavior around working with a hardcore addiction, even anxiety. The stress eating comes from stress. We're not hungry, but we're eating because of emotion. And what this highlights is how much stronger the feeling body is than the thinking brain. We misattribute reward and we say, oh, it was willpower. No, it's really more about reward value than willpower. This is how habits form. This is how habits change. And that reward is what keeps us going. You just answered the million dollar question. Instead of this myth willpower, we can simply ask these questions. I just want to quickly thank you for beginning to watch this podcast episode. If you haven't subscribed yet, feel free to do so. would love it if you join our community. You'll also be up to date on the latest content. And this really helps me reach out to more guests. You can also visit our website, centerformindfulness.ca. There's free events about mindfulness and laughter. Hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode. I am so excited to share a conversation with Dr. Judson Brewer. He's back for round two. The last time we covered his book, the New York Times bestselling book, Unwinding Anxiety. It's truly incredibly helpful book. I'll put the link in the show notes for that book. But for today, first, a warm welcome to you. Welcome to this episode. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, Dr. Judd, I am so hungry to get into your latest book, The Hunger Habit, Why We Eat When We're Not Hungry and How to Stop. I'm really excited about that. I want to share something about this book because it's a 21-day program for anyone struggling with overeating, stress eating, mindless eating, or any other type of habitual eating. Does this leave anyone out? I think that's all of us, right? All of us. And it's the only evidence-based, mindfulness-driven behavioral change curriculum to be approved by the Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention, the CDC. So a warm welcome to you again. And I wonder if we can just refresh listeners, if they didn't catch the, the last episode you were in, just about your background, and then maybe we'll get into this new book. What led you to this new book? So it's just a little bit of your background. Sure. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm also a neuroscientist and a professor at Brown University. And as a clinician, I've been spending the last couple of decades trying to help my patients change habits, whether it's working with a hardcore addiction, many different definitions for that, whether it's alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, cigarettes, et cetera, but also trying to help people change behavior around um, you know, even anxiety. So the Unwinding Anxiety book was around exploring anxiety as a habit and how to change that. And we've even developed digital therapeutics as a way to uh, kind of develop ways to get this type of methodology in the hands of anybody that has a smartphone, mm -hmm. but also as a scientist, really a helpful way to study these things to see how well they work because they've got high fidelity and we can, you can it, as a research study, if somebody opts in, you can actually track every click. What's amazing is the evidence base behind it. So it's not just like, a well, it sounds like a good idea. It's really research backed by the research that you've done in many others as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what led you to, from anxiety to hunger? Yeah. Eating habits. How did that link? Yeah, I've had when we were working with our. It, it, actually, it's interesting because even before working with anxiety, I was working with people that were trying to quit smoking, and mm -hmm. we were developing this app called Craving to Quit, where it was based on this randomized controlled trial where we'd gotten five times the quit rates of gold standard treatment for helping people quit smoking, mm -hmm. and that was using mindfulness training. And with that, we were starting to see how we could scale that and to develop this app, and we were giving some pilot feedback from pilot testers. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, oh, yeah, we're changing our eating habits. And I at first just ignored that because 
or I didn't listen carefully, let's put it that way, because most people who quit smoking gain 15 pounds on average because both the stimulant effect of nicotine, but also they substitute eating for smoking, right? It's mm -hmm. that if you want to get Freudian on it, that oral fixation, mm -hmm. but you don't even have to get Freudian on it. It's, you know, they need something to scratch that itch. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, substituting eating for smoking has been helpful for some people to quit smoking. But they were saying, don't no, don't jump to conclusions here. We're actually using these same techniques to change our eating habits. And at the time, I'd never thought about studying or helping people with eating. I'd learned in medical school, this formula calories in, calories out. And so I'd been counseling my patients to eat salad instead of <laughs> cake. <laughs> but anybody that's tried to tell themselves to eat salad instead of cake knows how well that works, mm -hmm. that, that willpower myth. And so we'd been seeing this with smoking and then started exploring this same methodology mm. with eating because this the dominant paradigm has been just use your willpower. It's a great marketing tool for yeah. any weight loss program because they can say our formula is right because calories in versus calories out is correct technically. Mm. And they can say, well, you just need more willpower, sign up for another year. So it's, mm. it's a good business strategy for someone trying to get you to keep honing up some more money. The problem with that, not only does it make our wallets lighter, but it also mm. makes us feel worse about ourselves because it tells us that there's something wrong with us. Mm. And that we need to be better as compared to asking them, hey, is that actually based on science? Can you show me mm -hmm. willpower from a neuroscience perspective? So as a neuroscientist, I get really interested in this because neuroscience, neuroscientists don't talk about willpower. Mm -hmm. They certainly talk about brain regions and networks involved in cognitive mm -hmm. control. But the things that control cognitive control have nothing to do with willpower. And it's really more about reward value than willpower. And so that gets really interesting because then we can say, well, what's what's the neuroscience-based approach and how can we actually use that to leverage behavior change? So that's how I got interested in this. So, so really, I mean, and it's something you cover in the book as well in terms of why most diets don't work. Mm -hmm. Like there's a whole industry around something that, you know, it's not very accurate. Yes. Yeah. It hasn't stopped people from marketing it, but the... <laughs> How often is marketing actually based on science? Yes. If something really works, you don't have to market it. <laughs> that, that, that's right. <laughs> it just works. Yeah. And then people tell their friends, they're like, oh, this works really well. That, that's right. That's the best marketing out there. Yeah, so true. I have to tell you, one of the things that surprised me, and, and part of me was like, what? Willpower has nothing to do with this? And it took mm -hmm. me back because I struggled as a child being overweight. And it's something mm. that was actually quite a challenge for me. And my dad was very like disciplined and in, in, like his exercise, take his cares of a body, work long hours, but he was just, he had all the pieces. He would only eat a tiny slice of whatever of dessert. And then it was just amazing. So one day he had to talk with me when I was quite overweight and kids mm -hmm. would make fun of me. I couldn't. And he said, you can change this. You, you can change this. Yeah, you just have to eat a little less and let's get you moving a little more. And it kind of worked for me at least. I didn't understand anything about mindfulness. Obviously, I was a kid at the time or, mm -hmm. or what it means, but something stuck with me. Maybe it's completely inaccurate thinking when there is a will, because he always said that when there is a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. So are we confusing will with other things like discipline or what, like what are we confusing will yeah. with? Yeah, we are giving the voice of, I would say, where there's a reward, there's a way. And so if you look at that, and this doesn't even need to be explicit, but when somebody sees that, you know, so for example, getting poked fun of or even bullied is not rewarding for anybody. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a pain point for them to change their behavior, mm -hmm. right? Now, granted, this isn't giving bullies free pass, obviously. Right. We need to work with bullying, but from the the being bullied standpoint, mm. it doesn't feel good for kids to be bullied. And so now they've got a motivator for change. Mm. And so for example, if you were made fun of for your weight, mm. there's that motivator that says, hey, do something about this. Yes. It really was and, that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So your dad can come in and say, hey, here's the thing to do, mm-hmm. right? And by doing that thing, you're being rewarded because you're not being made fun of as much. So there's that reward base that says, hey, it feels better to forego eating extra food, for example, right? Mm-hmm. That is less rewarding than the positive reinforcement I'm getting from, you know, you probably got praise from people saying, hey, it looks like you lost some weight. Oh, totally. Yeah. So you get that positive reinforcement mm-hmm. that then says, hey, that's pretty rewarding. Keep doing it, mm-hmm. right? That's different than saying, just force yourself. That's so true, actually. This is making a lot of sense as you're saying it because I had like friends, I had adults even say, oh, what are you doing? What's your secret? And I yep. started getting attention as a kid like who, yep. and at the time it was the Rocky movie and the boxing, Rocky and Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. And I had that music. It wasn't tapes then, right? So <laughs> you running up the stairs? <laughs> running up Drinking stairs. Drinking raw eggs. <laughs> and, and you, totally. I was so into, and that makes sense now. Getting yeah. rewarded. Yeah. So we misattribute yeah. that reward and we say, oh, it was willpower. No. Mm. Our brain is saying, this is good. Keep doing it. Mm. And that reward is what keeps us going, right? It feels good to run up the stairs. I mean, yeah. not physically, it can be tiring, but exercise actually feels good. Our bodies are made to exercise. Yeah. Right? As compared to sitting in a chair. I love how you said this. Like when there's reward, there's a way. That is so interesting. That should be a quote. There's a word, there's a way. Yeah. So so I'm wondering about hunger. Mm -hmm. You speak about the book, and I love how you laid out the book, kind of three sections. The first one is mapping out your habit, then interrupting it, then the new behavior, the new reward behavior. And Mm -hmm. I noticed the middle section, interrupting, is 10 chapters. It's kind of longer, so it's like interrupt. Can you say about, so we can cover some of that, what is hunger versus craving? Like, why do we have so much trouble between the two? Yeah. Well, it, back, we've got the survival mechanism of mm. what's called homeostatic hunger, meaning when we're out of balance, when we are low on calories, our body says, hey, get back in balance. And so we get a craving to eat some food. So that's a normal physiologic, you know, survival mechanism. In modern day, we've crossed wires a little bit, many people have, where they start to learn like at a birthday party. They're not necessarily hungry, but they eat some cake and some ice cream and they associate that with having fun and hanging out with their friends and Mm. being social and opening presents and things like that. And so they've then they start to, and how many times do we serve food at a celebration? All the time, right? If it's a celebration without food, there's something you know, you're like, what's going on? Where's the food? <laughs> Where's the drink? So culturally, and I don't know all cultures around the world, but I would guess for many cultures, not just Western culture, that food is associated with celebration. Yes. So there's that piece that gets a kind of miswired where we're learning, oh, celebrate. Like for I still remember the smell of movie popcorn when I was a kid because it was such a treat to go to movie. Mm. Wasn't hungry. Yes. Popcorn didn't even taste that good, but boy, was I gonna eat it. Like this was a celebration. Yes. And then we learn, oh well, if eating is associated with feeling good, or we learn, oh, when I'm sad, when I'm mad, when I'm frustrated, when, when I'm whatever. I can learn to eat to distract myself or to numb myself. A lot of my patients mm-hmm. describe that as numbing themselves from their negative emotions. And so we learn through both positive and negative reinforcement, right? These very key and core learning mechanisms. We learn to associate ce- celebration with food, not with hunger, mm-hmm. and also to learn distraction or avoidance, helping us mm-hmm. avoid unpleasant emotions with food. And so we get into this category which describe it's a misnomer. I love the term. It's called hedonic hunger. And it's a misnomer because we're not hungry, but we're eating specifically in the absence of hunger because of emotion. It's that food mood relationship that gets set up. So that's how the that's how the problem got established. So so you just answered the million dollar question, which is why we emotionally eat. Mm-hmm. Like that's fascinating. Like we we reach for something. So we avoid feeling something else. So yeah. somehow it's so comforting to have, even though we're not hungry, but just to avoid feeling sad or upset or 
Well, that's why there are carbs. There's so many categories of carbs called comfort foods, right? Yeah. They're not called distress foods. Like we're going to make you feel bad by eating this. <laughs> that's, that comes after where somebody eats a comfort food and they feel bad because they yes. eat, they weren't actually hungry. <laughs> So, and you know, when you were saying earlier about different cultures, it is so true because growing up in, in the Middle East, you get fed a lot, right? Mm. And you go to someone's dinner party and it's like, eat, oh, eat some more. You're like, I'm full. So you have to say like, you're full, like 10 minutes before you're really full. Otherwise it's like, no, eat some more. It's kind of offensive if you stop eating. It's right. Like, it's like the food it, equals love. Yeah. Is this not good food? Right, so, <laughs> so keep eating. Yeah, you're offending me if you don't eat my food, whether it's our grandparents or somebody having us over for dinner. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, exactly. It's like how could you, right? So kind of overriding those signals, and how important is that? You, you mentioned in the book, kind of getting to know these signals of hunger versus craving. Can you say mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's really important. So the first the first step is mapping out these habit loops. And the first fork in the road is being able to ask this question and, and answer it accurately. Am I hungry or am I eating because of a mood or distraction or boredom or just habit, right? Is it hunger or is it habit? That's the first step. And for a lot of my patients, actually, it, it took them a long time to differentiate those. Where you know, I still remember a patient saying, well, I just have a urge and I eat, right? And she could not tell the difference between when she was truly hungry and when it was just an itch that she needed to scratch because she'd scratched it so many times in the past. So what can help in discovering that? Well, that's where curiosity, mm -hmm. I, I think of this as a general superpower that we all can foster is getting curious and asking, oh, am I actually hungry? And checking to see what is specific to hunger. For example, rumbling stomach doesn't tend to happen when we're sad. <laughs> it's pretty specific to when we're actually hungry because our stomach mm. is empty. We can also ask, when's the last time I ate? And we can ask ourselves, what type of food am I reaching for? If we're reaching for some comfort food, that can be a signal that we're feeling uncomfortable. Yes. So this is the mindfulness piece then. We're bringing yes. the curiosity. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about that for those who are not as familiar? Like, what is this mindfulness thing? Like, why, <laughs> why, how come this thing is working? Like, and we have a neuroscientist is talking about it. Like, what well, is this? about this, I'll say, forget about the word mindfulness because it's a concept and let's get it mm. the pop the hood and look at what equals mindfulness. So that... Mm. If you look at the components of mindfulness, mm. it's really about curiosity, this attitude of curiosity and being aware in the present moment, right? So we can think of it as being curious about what's happening right now. So whatever mindfulness might mean, we all know, know what curiosity feels like. I said, oh, what is this quality of experience as compared to, oh, no, I know how this is going to go. And that's where we're judging something or we're prejudging something. Mm. So there's something about paying attention with curiosity. So, because many moments in the day, our mind is not really there. It's somewhere right. else. It's daydreaming, remembering, planning, thinking. So it's something about intentionally in your program is really paying, like getting to know it, like paying attention and yeah. without judgment, which is part of mindfulness. Like we're not going to judge it. Just here's how it is. Yeah. yeah. And we can, one way that I think of this as a, sign of being curious is just checking the inner inflection of our voice. Are we going, or, or are we going, oh, and that, that upward inflection, that tends to, or hmm, that tends to be a sign of authentic curiosity as compared mm. to just going through the motions. What do you do with people who become aware of it, pay attention and go, oh, here's my habit again, mm -hmm. but they still eat that extra piece of cake. How do you it's a great question. <laughs> yeah. And that's where we get into the second step. So the first step is really about recognizing, is it hunger? Is it habit? And the second step, it really, it's as simple as that. And mm -hmm. we, we can map it out, but really, is it, am I, am I reaching for food because I'm hungry or is it a habit? And what type of habit is it? So we go, oh, I'm reaching for food. But if I go ahead and eat it, then we can go, oh, and we can ask basically, what am I getting from this? 
Mm. And what that does is tap into this reward value system in our brain, which is extremely strong. This is how habits form. This is how habits change. This is the only way that habits change. If you look at the neuroscience, the formulas are pretty simple and pretty specific. They are really focused on there's a specific error term that determines whether a reward value is going to change in somebody's brain. If somebody's if something is rewarding, we're going to keep doing it. If it's not rewarding, we're going to stop. You mean Simple example error? is that what you're referring to when you say error yes. prediction error? Yeah, yeah. Can, positive yeah. and negative prediction error. So, yeah. what is a positive prediction error? Common day example would be, let's say there's a new chocolate chocolate chocolate. Chocolatee, chocolatee, chocolate yes. <laughs> Here we go. A chocolatee that opens up in my neighborhood, right? A chocolate shop. And I go in and I have a particular hank hankering for mango habanero truffles. I've, I've actually had some fabulous mango habanero truffles. You're making me um, hungry, like a Judd? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There are some, there's a chocolate shop. My wife's from Seattle and, and my mother-in-law will occasionally give me these chocolates from the area that are just amazing. And so I have this standard set by this chocolaterie mm. in near Seattle that's like, these are good. And so if I go to the chocolaterie in my neighborhood that just opened up and I eat their mango habanero truffle and I'm like, mind blown. This is even better than the best that I've ever had. I get what's called a positive prediction error, meaning it's better than expected. So my what happens in my brain is dopamine fires and I learn, hey, this is a good chocolate to read. Mm -hmm. So come back here, get their truffles again. <laughs> Camp out, whatever. Right. <laughs> On the other hand, if I have a high bar for mancobinero truffles and I eat theirs and I'm like, meh, I've had better. I get a negative prediction error. Oh, and I also get a dopamine firing in my brain that says, hey, they need to learn a thing or two. And so wow. I learn, don't go back here. Don't eat their truffles. They're not as good. Save your calories for the good ones. For future ones, yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's expectations then, really. Like it's if it meets our expectation or it's like beneath what we expect it to be. Mm -hmm. And the key there is awareness. We have mm -hmm. to pay attention. And so if we pay attention, we, we even did a study, we published this a couple of years ago, where we bring this so people don't have to learn this through mango habanero truffles. They can learn this with their everyday habits. And so we did a study where we had people pay attention as they overate, right? Just on the regular overeating basis, whatever it was, whether it was daily or a couple of times a week or weekly. And we had them pay attention and ask the question, like, how content do I feel? And with that, we could actually measure the shift in the reward value because nobody comes back when they pay attention and says to me, oh, thank you. I never realized how great it feels to overeat. Anybody that can remember back to the last time they overate, whether it was a celebration or a holiday meal or whatever, they're like, oh, I felt terrible and they're bloated and they feel lethargic and all this. Nothing positive comes from overeating because our body is saying, why did you do that? Yes. I didn't need all of those calories and I'm going to point that out to you, hopefully, so you'll listen. Mm. So we can have people pay attention so they listen to their bodies more. And it only takes 10 to 15 times of somebody overeating for that reward value to drop below zero. Wow. Yeah. And what this highlights is how much stronger the feeling body is than the thinking brain, right? We can tell ourselves until we're blue in the face that we shouldn't overeat, mm. or we can just listen to the body that's saying, dude, this doesn't feel good. Right? We can become disenchanted with that behavior. And as we become disenchanted, it's much easier to shift the behavior because we can remember what it's like. Oh, last time I did this, it was like this. And this is what our brains are really good at doing, which is predicting the future based on past experience. And so if we build up, we I call this in the book, the disenchantment database. Mm -hmm. I actually got this from one of the, from Jackie, who was one of the people in the book who's, who went through mm -hmm. this change herself. She describes, describes this as her disenchantment data bank, right? And, you, and once you've developed that data bank, you can recall it much more easily. And it's much easier to be like, oh, do I really want to overeat? No, it doesn't feel good. And so we can draw on that drop in reward value instead of trying this myth of willpower. Mm. And that's where real change happens. Now, as you're describing this, is this one of the reasons why 
the hunger cues, the volume are so much louder than the fullness cues. Like when you're hungry, just like, ah, you just got to eat really hungry. Yeah. But when we're full, like somehow, I, I know you describe it in the book as a whisper, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I guess, is this what you're helping as well in your book and your work is listening to that whisper because it's kind of not as loud as when we're hungry. Yes, giving it a microphone because mm. when we're starving, our body says, get food in here now. But when we're full, it's not as much, it's not as critical as getting calories in. Like if we overeat a little bit from a bodily standpoint and saying, well, if there's famine, I'm going to, I'm going to save some for later <laughs> yeah. so that I can survive the famine. But in modern day, most people don't have to worry about the famine. Right. Something uh, a couple of days ago, what happened and preparing for us connecting, it made me look at one of the strategies you have. And the book is filled with strategies and it's this retrospective, like looking back at something. And yeah. what, what happened is I love vegetables with my egg in the morning. And so quite a bit kind of cooked vegetables. And we had some extra tomatoes that were kind of about to go bad. I was like, let me just use it. And I like it was more than I usually eat. So visually, mm -hmm. I knew, okay, this is more, but I'm like, ah, it's okay. That like took me over and I really felt uncomfortable. Mm. And I was like, I don't want to throw it away. But it really made me tune in. And when I reflected back, I thought my body was telling me, I to just like, can you please stop eating? Yeah. And yeah. it was just only like maybe like whatever, 10 more spoons, but I shoved that tomato. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, and our bodies can say hey leftovers come on how hard is this to put this in the fridge and yeah. <laughs> eat it for a snack later so, yes so, so this brings up emotion mm. so how do how can we work with emotion whether it's shame or guilt or regret as we go through this program or this material because there's a lot of shaming like oh what's wrong with me or why did i eat this way or how do we work with that yeah, it's a great question. So this is where the third step comes in, right? Mm -hmm. So the first step is mapping it out. Am I hungry or is it a habit? Second step is basically asking, what am I getting from this? Mm -hmm. Is this, is the amount that I'm eating, is the type of food I'm eating truly rewarding? And if it's an unhealthy habit, we start to get that into focus and become disenchanted. Mm -hmm. The third step I think of is finding the bigger, better offer. And this is where, to get at your question, this is where not only can we see, for example, that it feels better just to stop when we're full, mm -hmm. right? It feels better than overeating, right? So there's a bigger, better offer right there. Or we can start to see, oh, eating a health. So for me, I shifted from eating gummy worms as like kind of a comfort mm -hmm. stress food to eating blueberries. They just, mm -hmm. for me, blueberries taste so much better. And I wouldn't get all caught up in the process and get the sugar rush and crush and all of that. So there's a bigger, better offer there. Mm -hmm. On top of this, the stress eating comes from stress. And so eating a bunch of gummy worms or some comfort foods might temporarily make us feel better because we're distracting. Yes. Us. It's not actually going to get at the root cause. And so here I think of this as, well, we can ask ourselves, what do I actually need versus what do I want? Because right? mm -hmm. we want some food to make us to soothe that mood. And that only serves as a temporary soothing and then feeds the habit versus if we meet that need. So we can learn to meet what the need is mm -hmm. and then to meet the need. So is this the liking versus wanting you described in, in the book, this, this plateau? Is is that what you're referring to? This reaching that, a point where we, we still like it? So I think uh, that certainly can be the case. So for example, this isn't going to make us not like mango habanero truffles, mm. but it can help us enjoy the truffle as a piece of dessert as compared to shove it down because I want this unpleasant emotion to go away. Yeah. Right? And we're not even paying attention to the food. If it's ice cream, eating the half gallon of ice cream to numb ourselves and not actually paying attention while the food's in our mouth because we're shoveling it down so quickly to shifting that to, hey, I'm feeling sad. How do I meet that and take care of that sadness? Mm. And then we take care of that. Then we can have some ice cream for dessert. Right. It's very different motivation. So, yeah. You're not saying like stop eating ice cream or stop eating foods you enjoy, stop eating anything 
but it's actually bringing awareness to it, paying attention yeah. and bringing a sense of kindness when we kind of relapse too. Yeah. And is, is that part of the connection with addiction? Like with breaking eating habits, it's, there's going to be relapse. Oh yeah. There's so many. And some people even argue that really struggle with eating in certain ways that falls into the category of addiction. So if you look at the def mm -hmm. simple definition of addiction, continued use despite adverse consequences. So if somebody eats a half gallon of ice cream because they're sad and they've developed diabetes, well, there are adverse consequences showing up in their physical health. Mm. So somebody might say, well, doesn't that fall into the category or at least in the spectrum of addiction? And not that we need to argue over whether something's an addiction or not. I like to focus pragmatically and ask, well, is somebody suffering here? Yeah. Right. And so diabetes is it's, people definitely suffer when they've got diabetes whether somebody puts it in the category of addiction or not we can look at what's the behavior is somebody eating in a way that feels uncontrolled right and mm -hmm. often control even can be a trigger word because people feel like oh they have to control themselves well the nice part about awareness and leveraging the strength of our brain is that our brain will do all this control for us mm -hmm. as long as we pay attention so it's we don't have to force ourselves to try to control our behavior. We can simply ask these questions. What am I getting from doing this? For example, overeating. And what's a way to be kind to myself? What's the kindest thing I can do? Well, meeting our needs is a, one of the kindest things we can do. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we can start to shift out of some of these unhealthy habits that have just fed those wants. Mm. And, and you mentioned this kindness with it. Right. So, mm -hmm. because there's going to be, we're going to trip over some of our habits because we're habitual, mm -hmm. habitual habits, autopilot. Yes. You're right. So, it's getting to discover them and not to shame them. Yes. Getting to know them and work with them. Yeah. And I know one of the things you name as well is naming, like naming <laughs> things. So, how does naming help us in working with these habits? So being able to name what's happening helps bring in what's described in physics as the observer effect or in psychology as the Hawthorne effect, which is basically pointing out that if you're observing something, you can't be identified with it mm. because you're providing that perspective and that, that distance of perspective mm. that helps us see, oh, here's this feeling, this sensation, this thought I, as compared to I am that feeling, sensation, or thought. Mm. And so we can name it, oh, there's sadness as compared to I am sad, where we're mm. identified with it. And we can name craving as compared to I have a craving. Oh, what's craving feel like? And we can explore the sensations and how they change. And the fact that by observing them, we're less identified with them. And on top of that, by observing them, we can see that we don't have to succumb to them. So there's a bit of space, even as you're saying that, like even observing them, we're interrupting the moment yes. rather than just getting caught in it. Yes. There's a bit of space, but it's not a detached space. It's No, it's yeah, very engaged. Yeah. yeah. Where there's space, there's freedom to operate. <laughs> that freedom as compared to when we're identified with something, we're just going to habitually react. Mm. Which takes me back to even the definition of habit, which we didn't cover. I wanted to ask you earlier on, why do we even, you mentioned set and forget. We have a lot of habits. Are habits generally bad? Oh, most habits are actually very helpful for us. Mm. So we live most of our lives going through tons of habit routines every day. And they're set up so we don't have to relearn all these things things that should be habits that are helpful for us every day. So for example, walking, it's great that walking is a habit. Learning how to right. get our, our we'll learn fork it every day. Mouth. Imagine every day we have to learn it again. Right, right. Yeah. Speaking, right? Language. It's a habit. So we can we don't have to relearn how to speak every day. We don't have to relearn our vocabulary. We don't have to relearn how to shower, how to type. All these things, those are helpful habits. So, so we're not making habits the villain here. We're just looking closer at our habits and whether they're benefiting us or not. That's, Absolutely. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Is this helpful? Is it not helpful? Yeah. Yeah. I'm smiling because remembering one of the terms you use in the book about the eating ghost. Like that. Mm. I guess that's a habit that's not 
very helpful just feeding that never ending ghost what is that eating yeah ghost? the hungry ghost you, you yeah. hungry ghost yeah this actually goes back to ancient buddhist times because it is such a common phenomenon and the idea the image is a beautiful one because it's so descriptive where imagine this ghost with a small mouth and a long narrow esophagus and a huge stomach so no matter how much it eats because of the limit of the size of its mouth and its esophagus its belly is never full yeah and that's what we do literally when we're eating to numb our emotions is we just it can never be enough because it's not actually meeting that need right that's such a good visual to have mm -hmm. and that could be even naming i wonder it can well, is ah there's that hungry ghost yeah yeah here's a hungry ghost there it is it's back <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like a visitor and sometimes it will show up Yes. Right. And meeting working. that with kindness and curiosity, because it's a reminder of, oh, this is my brain, where there have been these wires that have been crossed a little bit, where it's learned as a habit to eat out of out of habit as compared yeah. to out of hunger. And then we can, that also helps us be kind and open to the moment to learn and say, oh, okay, how'd this go last time? How well did it work? Mm. Oh, <laughs> didn't actually help me meet my needs and i actually felt guilty because i ate when i wasn't hungry oh well what might i try this time oh maybe i'll meet my needs what do i actually need right now mm. so really update upgrade this software in the, yeah. in the brain We're updating here's new information speaking of information the book is truly filled the hunger habit filled with such helpful tips, truly, I highly recommend it. I will put the link in the show notes again. I think it was also incredibly clever. You're naming it a 21-day program. <laughs> <laughs> because most people think it takes 21 days. Is that what led you to call it, like, doing the 21-day? Yeah. So thank you for highlighting this. This is kind of a little, what do they call it, an Easter egg, where it's like, oh, here's a surprise. The I named it that. So certainly I broke it down into bite-sized pieces. Ha ha, I guess pun intended, where there are different practices each on each day or each step where somebody can build their skills. But I broke it into 21, I broke it into 23 or 25 or 18 or whatever. But I made it 21 as a nod to how much garbage is out there on the internet. Mm. And one of the internet myths is that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. <laughs> so, so that is not true if you look at the science. Mm -hmm. And people can read about where that myth came from. They can look it up on the internet. They don't need to read my book. Mm -hmm. But if they look on the internet, how long does it take, take to form a new habit? The most common hit they'll get on the internet is 21 days because that has become an internet meme. It is not true. Not There's true, no science no. behind that. No. So if someone who uses this program or gets the book, if things don't change in 21 days, they haven't failed. They have not, right. right. They could they change could. in 21 days. We found that it only takes 10 to 15 times of somebody paying attention as they overeat for that reward value to drop below zero. But that doesn't mean that's within a 15-day period because most people don't overeat and pay attention every day, right? Mm. So it's really it really depends on how often somebody's struggling with whatever the behavior is and how much they're paying attention. Yes. That actually struck me by line in your book. This repeated observation is what creates mm. change. Repeated yeah. observation is just oh observing. I, I have, I know we're almost at the end. I have uh, two questions I'm curious about. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of them is this whole area of intermittent fasting mm. and, and like how, because that does involve like ignoring the hunger signals whether it's a 16 4 or whatever it was no 16 8 is it yeah 16 8 well combo. they're different yeah different they're different combinations links the people different use. so often yeah. it's yeah it'll be these time windows in which somebody will eat can be eight they can be 10 they can be 12 hours typically it's not longer than 12 hours yeah for the for the the eating period and there's growing evidence, and again, this is not for everyone, but there's growing evidence that, and some people describe it as time-restricted eating, but restricted eating can be a trigger for a lot of people. So yeah. I think of it as giving our bodies time to rest and digest. 
Mm. And so if we give our bodies time to rest and digest, whether it's 12 hours of rest, whether it's 14 hours of rest, whether it's 16 hours of rest, there's there have been a number of studies suggesting that there are health benefits to that, mm. both physically and even mentally, some would argue. The physical ones have been the most studied. Now, you're saying, so how does that to just jump in there? I would suggest that it's not about ignoring the hunger mm. signals. I would say it's about resetting and learning to work with habitual cravings. So for example, one of the simplest way to start, ways to start is somebody finishing dinner at a reasonable time, say 6 p.m. And if they want to go 12 hours, not eating breakfast until at least 6 a.m. If they want to go 14 hours, not eating breakfast until 8 a.m. Right. A lot of people, that's relatively straightforward. And they get to start to work with nighttime snacking. Nighttime snacking is not about when we're hungry. It's about a habit. Yes. They just had dinner. So they get to work with, oh, what's it feel like to have this urge to eat? And how? what's it feel like to work with that craving mm. and learn to write it out? And it turns out that it's within a week, people can get used to that pretty quickly and learn to write out these cravings and not push them away, but just learn to accept them and invite them in. Sometimes I've, one of the most common fears that I've heard is people say, oh, if I go to bed hungry, I can't get to sleep. Surprising how somebody yeah. can just note, oh, a little bit of, and if they're not hungry, they're going to note craving mm. and then be able to get to sleep, especially if they've developed otherwise healthy sleep hygiene. Yeah. So it's not a contradiction. It can complement some of yeah. the work you're doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the last thing I'm curious about, and this is kind of future based, is I mm -hmm. was thinking about the connections in your research and work in terms mm -hmm. of habits we have around work, overworking habit mm -hmm. or addictions to overworking or procrastination. <laughs> and I yeah. thought, is there a book coming up by any chance? Like, I was like, well, I wonder if that might be an interesting book too, this overworking <laughs> or procrastination habit, right? Yeah. Well, certainly I don't know if I need to write a whole book on procrastination or maybe I'll get around to that sometime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the these principles can be certainly used for these yeah. types of things. We can start, same is true. We can ask ourselves, what am I getting for procrastinating? And then is there a bigger, better offer mm. that just simply comes with doing the work? Because it's got to get done at some point. Yeah. So I think we can certainly apply these. Or if somebody has the habit of overworking, they can ask, what am I getting from this? And they can do a <laughs> intermittent work fast where they just put work away at night and see if they come back in the morning refreshed as compared to checking their emails up until the time they go to sleep or checking their phone first thing when they wake up in the morning as compared to maybe taking some time to do some self-care, mm. meditation, yoga, exercise, not phone. Because the emails can generally wait. What a beautiful description as you, we extend all this deep insight and research to other areas as well, including mm -hmm. this working procrastinating. So I so deeply enjoy having conversation with you. I really want to thank you. I know we're at the end. I want to thank all the listeners as well for listening and watching. If it is YouTube, if uh, I'll put in the link where they can find you. Is there is it just your main site? of DrJud.com is probably the easiest one, drjud.com. You can okay. find me on Instagram, dr.jud. Okay, I'll include that. Thank you very much again. And for the viewers, if you found this useful, feel free to share, like. If you haven't done already, subscribe. May your moments be filled with ease and may be present with as many of them. Thank you.